The name Guantanamo Bay has become infamous, a detention camp on a naval base in Cuba where the US military holds terrorists, even the masterminds behind the September the 11th attacks. But the base has been at the center of worldwide controversy over alleged violations of human and legal rights of the detainees. It's illegal and it causes deep harm to our legal system as well as to the individuals who are suffering this human rights violation. There have been accusations of severe mistreatment of the prisoners and even torture. It has been a hot button issue for president after president. There are cold blooded killers. I'm absolutely committed to closing the detention facility at Guantanamo. To keep open the detention facilities in Guantanamo Bay. One of the main purposes of Guantanamo Bay is to gather intelligence on terrorist organizations to ultimately try and foil future attacks and save US lives. Today the base has around 30 prisoners and the US government is holding special military trials looking for the death penalty for a number of them. Between 2004 and 2006, Jennifer Bryson was a lead interrogator at the base, dealing mainly with detainees from Saudi Arabia. Now, for the first time, she tells her story on camera. And one detainee I knew was friends with one of the attackers and was very proud of the work that his friend had done. And they would boast about this? Yes, oh yes. And explains how she started to feel uneasy with some of the interrogation methods being used at the base. I just felt there's something wrong with this. And talks about why she believes interrogations should never become torture. The cruelty of torture. And here, cruelty of torture is not only cruelty to the detainee being tortured. Many people would wonder why should we show them compassion or mercy. This is her story from inside Guantanamo Bay. Jennifer, it is great to meet you and thank you so much for doing this interview. Thanks for this opportunity. What strikes you first when you walk onto the base at Guantanamo Bay? The first impression comes from the air because you've got to fly in. This is a small military base off on the side of the island of Cuba. Um, so the landscape, the bay, um, and then what's strikes one next is how isolated it is. And you were quite young when you landed at Guantanamo Bay. I was in my early 30s. And you have an incredible, a fascinating background and an illustrious CV. A PhD from Yale, you're described as a Christian scholar. You worked at the US embassies in Yemen and in Egypt. You were a journalist with people like PBS and CBS and with the Department of Defense as well. How did you end up at Guantanamo Bay? The first step is that after the attacks on the US of 9-11, I went to work for the Defense Intelligence Agency. I spoke Arabic, I had a PhD in Greco-Arabic and Islamic studies, and then, unknown to me, some higher ups in Washington DC came up with the idea to train me to be an interrogator and send me to Guantanamo. Uh, this wasn't my idea. Why did you want the job? I wanted to defend my country. After the attacks of 9-11, um, it was absolutely horrifying. And we have something, even with all the political challenges and difficulty now in America, we have something good going. Um, and also as a teenager, um, hopping back to the 1980s, I had studied in East Germany, former East Germany in the communist country for two semesters. And that really opened my eyes and gave me a tremendous appreciation for some of the freedoms um, that we have in the West and some of um, the political stability um, that we have. And so I appreciated uh, my country and I wanted to offer to do what I could. And that's why I wanted to work for the Department of Defense. So when you arrived at the base, what kind of environment was it? You were a young woman in their 30s, as you said, non-military, the first civilian to be brought into a role like this. What was it like? Being in a detention setting um, is 
really just a fundamentally different experience. If one has never been, for example, in a prison before, um, the who who controls the key, who controls the locks, um, the fear of um, threats against the personnel from the detainees, and there's suddenly so many new considerations all at once. People now have seen those images of the detainees in the orange jumpsuits, often with their hands tied behind their backs, blindfolded, maybe kneeling down in the courtyard. Would you see the detainees often? We saw them often. Um, the, the Joint Task Force had the, we called inside the wire, um, the wired area where the detainee, uh, detainees lived. And the inter interrogation offices were inside of the wire in the same area. Um, so when the detainees would pass by going to interrogation or going to a dentist appointment, whatever, we would see them regularly. I believe today at Guantanamo there are approximately 32 detainees. When you were there, what kind of people were the detainees? Who are these men and what are they being accused of? Well, for one thing, when I arrived there were hundreds of detainees. The detainees uh, were from many different countries um, and for managing the intelligence collection we had them divided up into four groups geographically. And to give you some idea of, again, that they were from so many different countries, is uh, three of these groups, we supervised them with what we called teams, um, had detainees from multiple countries. One group had you know, Europe and North Africa, another group uh, we called Central Asia. Detainees were from Afghanistan, Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, um, also Pakistan was in that group. And then a whole other group had detainees um, that we called Gulf states, that would have detainees from UAE, Bahrain, and also Yemen. So the second largest group of detainees present in Guantanamo was from Yemen. And then there was a fourth group in which the detainees were all from one country. And all of those detainees were from Saudi Arabia because one out of four detainees at Guantanamo was from Saudi Arabia. And I was assigned to be an interrogator as well as the interrogation team chief for the detainees from Saudi Arabia. So for two years, my life was all Saudi, all the time. Would you do the interrogations as well, face to face with some yes. of these men? What were they like when you were with them in person? They were guys. They were human beings. Um, Did they respect you as a woman? Yes. Um, however, this also depended on how I conducted myself. So, for example, I, um, having, I'd already lived, as a, you've mentioned, in Egypt and Yemen, and I had traveled in other areas in the Arabic-speaking Middle East. Um, and I was aware that women in Saudi culture are very important, but they're important in a way that's different in our culture. So being aware of this, um, I would go into an interrogation, for example, aware that um, modesty is valued, um, respect is valued, women who are family relations are highly valued and respected. Um, so for example, I made a point of always dressing well. Um, my shirts were always ironed. This was important. The Saudis, were, the Saudis in particular, Guantanamo, were very sophisticated. Um, quite a few of them were well educated and also they thought very highly of themselves. Mm. Many of them were leaders. Some had been low-level detainees who'd been training at the camps, others were mid-level leaders, others had been attack planners from attacks that people have heard of, um, others were higher-up leaders, there were many who were deep into, active to, and committed to Al-Qaeda. And among the Saudi detainees in particular, they were more likely to be leaders and planners. Did you find it difficult to sit across from some of the men knowing what they had orchestrated in the past, or planning to orchestrate in the future, what they wanted in their, their hearts and their mind, ultimately to see your demise and your country's demise sitting across from you? One of the important parts of the interrogation training for the interrogator was to leave yourself outside of the room. 
It's difficult to do. And so to give you an example of that. You can't let your emotions lead. Right, because the interrogator needs to be in control of the conversation. And the detainees were very smart, as I mentioned. They knew how to push the interrogator's buttons. And many of them would be looking for opportunities to provoke the interrogator, to get the interrogator off balance. Um, and so if a detainee would want to tell me how great he thought the attacks of 9-11 were, and one detainee I knew was friends with one of the attackers and was very proud of the work that his friend had done. And they would boast about this. Yes. Oh, yes. My job is to listen and try to understand. When it's clear to me that something's important to him and he's proud about it, I could say to him something like, wow, it sounds like this was really important to you. Um, to acknowledge that for him, um, this is important. Because I was there to gather information. I wasn't um, there to try to change his mind. I wasn't there to lecture him. In that moment, I couldn't be Jennifer the American who's angry, who's upset. I had to be a professional interrogator who's there to gather information. Um, we had a job to do. And the US military's method of interrogation is fundamentally based on rapport, which is a human connection between two people. And maintain, building rapport is the first step that's slow and difficult. Building and trust. Yes. Maintaining rapport is incredibly important. Let me offer you an example, if I may. You're a journalist. Mm. When we started this interview today, you were relaxed, you were friendly. When I walked into the room, you welcomed me, you introduced yourself. And I started to feel relaxed and began looking forward to this conversation we're going to have. Now imagine if you, as a journalist, had seen me walk in the room and had started yelling at me and insulting me. I would have crawled back into my shell like a turtle, and I'd stay there. An interrogation is not entirely different. You've got to create an environment where an open human conversation is possible. Another one of your roles, or was this the main part of your position there at Guantanamo, was to oversee some of the other interrogators and sign off on their interrogation techniques. So they would come to you with a plan and say, this is how we want to interrogate this detainee. And you would look at it and either block it or permit it. A key role of the team chief in the US interrogation system is that for 100% of the interrogations, the interrogator must have a plan. And it's a written plan for that individual interrogation. Um, and the supervisor must sign off on that plan. Assuring th that s things are done with excellence for success, but also within the guidelines of what is allowed and not outside. So when did you start to become uneasy with what was being put in front of you? When I arrived to be the team chief, as I mentioned, I had to hit the ground running because the previous team chief for this team had already left the island um, a bit before. So I was immediately the team chief in charge. Already right away, there were two interrogators who sent me requests to conduct interrogations using methods that had nothing in any way, shape, or form to do with our training. Um, and this is when I began to feel uneasy and really have to realize I'm going to have to make a decision here. What were those methods that they wanted to use? There were some um, interrogators down there who would bring detainees into a darkened room with um, strobe lights and really harsh music, music that I would describe as, as headbanger music. And something that was very peculiar to me in these proposals is there was detailed information about the music will only be at such and such decimal level, which is below a level that you know would, would cause permanent hearing damage. Hearing, as if this level of detail, technical detail, made it okay. Um, I felt incredibly uncomfortable with what they were proposing. Also, what they were proposing made no sense in terms of 
building rapport and rapport being the foundation on which you're able to have a conversation and gather information. And, and, and the other thing was I was simply expected to approve these because some interrogators had been doing this before and they felt like, well, of course they should be doing this. You started to see things and you thought, in my good conscience, I cannot stand over this. I just felt there's something wrong with this. Not only that it's not in the list of approved methods, but something in my gut just felt like there's just something wrong with this. Do you ever think that there are exceptional circumstances, and I mean exceptional, where the boundaries and the limits of what is acceptable in intelligence gathering can really be pushed and stretched in order to gather information? The limits that the U.S. has on intelligence gathering, and here I'll speak specifically about the U.S. military because that was my experience, are actually incredibly helpful. Because if you're going to say, well, sometimes there might be cases where we ignore the limits, well, then how on earth do you define which situations those are? How do you define who's going to make that decision? In addition, I would like to suggest two ways of looking at problems with torture. One is it's ineffective, and I can get back to that. The second is the cruelty of torture. And here, that cruelty of torture is not only cruelty to the detainee being tortured. I think there's three groups of humans that we have to consider in this situation. First, the detainee, because that person um, is in a very vulnerable situation and doesn't have power. So you have to consider that that is a human being first. But second, the interrogator is a human being. Who, who, who thinks about the interrogator? We also need to think about the interrogator. What are you asking the interrogator to do that that interrogator has to live with for the rest of their life? And that interrogator will go before God at his or her death. And so you've also got to consider the interrogator. And the third group I mentioned is we need to consider the human beings who can be protected by excellence in intelligence gathering. When you mentioned the first group to protect the, de the detainee, the vulnerable detainee who was there, but again back to those exceptional circumstances, when you look at like the person that you were interrogating who was boasting about having a friend who was involved in flying those planes into the Twin Towers or into the Pentagon or the one that crashed in Pennsylvania. And you look at that one day when 3,000 people were murdered, why many people would wonder why should we show them compassion and mercy? So as I mentioned, the compassion that's being shown is being shown to multiple groups of human beings at once. Also, precisely in an extraordinary situation, what's often called a ticking time bomb scenario, ticking bomb scenario. It's precisely in that moment that you want to use the best methods that you can. One of the problems with torture is people desperately want to just make it stop and will say anything. And I think as Catholics, there's a, an example from this that I've been wanting to write about that I think if we look at the history of the torture of saints, you can see that torture is used to try to get people to lie. So let's look at, for example, the Diocletian persecutions in the early Catholic Church, where you have a government in the empire that's hostile to Christians. And the government wants them to make a public political statement saying, I reject Christianity, because this was, after all, somewhat political, having, having a group having a different belief set had political implications. And they knew that torture would get some people to finally just say out loud, I reject Christianity. Mm. And that government, they don't actually really care what's in that person's heart. They want the public statement because it's useful. The public display. The history of torture shows us that it's useful for people to 
lie to say what they think the torturers want to hear. And I'm playing devil's advocate, Jennifer, knowing that our audience will be pretty divided on the issue, um, particularly with 9-11 still so fresh in their, in, their, in their mind's eye. But there must be, if some of these interrogators that were coming to you with these plans, presumably these are experienced military personnel as well, who would, if they were sitting here, say, well, first we try the rapport approach. And when that fails, and when we do believe there are imminent threats to American soil, and I know the US government believed that many of these detainees were, as you said, high-level Al-Qaeda leaders who were interested in developing chemical, biological, and even nuclear weapons against the United States. So they say when the other methods fail, we need the information and we need it quick. And that's when we resort to these extremely, I think they call it enhanced interrogation techniques. You open up a huge risk if you say, well, we'll try a rapport, and if that doesn't work, then um, I dislike this phrase, but people say, like, the gloves come off. Mm. Then you run the risk that somebody who simply is failing in interrogation can use, well, rapport didn't work in that case, so I had to be harsh, as an excuse. Um, rather than trying to figure out why is there difficulty in this particular situation. I remember reading you once talk as well about an interesting point in that these people come into Guantanamo Bay radical and that if they are tortured or if these extreme methods are used in them and they return back to their country of origin, you're sending them back probably even more radical Yes. Then they came in. And I think at Guantanamo, 800 detainees have, have come through since its opening. 11 have gone to trial, only two convicted. Majority have gone back uh, to the countries they've come from. So you think the focus should always be on the building the trust, building the relationship and trying to elicit the information that way? Yes, because that is the method that can get to the truth of the matter. And when having a conversation and wanting to get to information, if the person you're talking with is frightened, their brain physically is going to go into a defensive mode, fight, flight, or freeze. Whereas if you want to have a conversation with somebody who's fully accessing as much of their memory as possible, if they are relaxed, they're going to be able to access more memory because you want accuracy, you want detail. Did you feel like a pariah on the base when you started saying no to these experienced interrogators? You were just fresh in the role and you started telling me you cannot do this. There were some who definitely looked down on me for making this decision. And especially because I was brand new and, there, and as I said, female, civilian, Yale, PhD. There was distrust before I even landed on the island. Even before I arrived, when I was still in Washington, D.C., and I found out I was going to be in charge of the Saudi team, I was told by some colleagues who um, had contact with people in Guantanamo and some who had been there, oh, Saudis don't talk. Everybody I talked to said, oh, yeah, well, that'll be tough. Saudis don't talk. Well, I didn't believe that. They're human beings. Human beings will have conversations. When I arrived, the Saudi team, week after week after week, had zero reports. After my first deployment there at the end of six months, the Saudi team and my last briefing to the general had more reports than any other team on the island. And we did that through rapport building. When you're sitting with them in that room interrogating them, would you feel sorry for the men? I needed to understand where the detainee was at on any given day. So let me give you an example. Let's say it was a hot day and that the only um, slot in the schedule I could get for an interrogation room and for the guards to move the detainee was in the afternoon. So I could be aware the detainee coming in that day might be hot and tired. Is being, being aware that he might be uncomfortable is not necessarily the same thing as feeling sorry for him um, in a way that might make me want to start saying, gosh, you know, maybe the detainee is the one who's right and I'm wrong. 
being aware that your detainee is uncomfortable. Also, I had one detainee who was not getting any mail, whereas other detainees were. And simply being aware he might be feeling lonely um, is part of understanding where he's at and what he's going through. It's not an emotional step um, so long as the interrogator is thinking through this carefully. It's not an emotional step that then um, makes one so sympathetic to the detainee that one forgets the mission that one has. Because mm. I'm, I'm sure it is, you're only human, it's hard sometimes when the person is sitting across from you and you're dealing with the person one-on-one -on -one in that moment yeah. in time. They're exhausted, they're tired, they're weak, maybe they have suffered harsh interrogation techniques, they're telling you about it. and. But I mean, and we probably have, we don't have enough time to talk about this, we would need days, but when you looked at the person in front of you, the man, and did you feel sorry for them in a way, how did their life get to this point where they have so much hate in them and they want death, they want to see others suffer, they believe it's for a greater cause in their mind, but did you look at them and think, um, how did you get like this in life? Well, of course, we were very, very interested to know um, their backgrounds, and that was one of the fascinating part of the jobs, was getting to know their life stories. Um, every human life has difficulties, but also these are adults who had made decisions and choices. And they're and driven primarily by their, by their faith, by their interpretation of Islam. Uh, yeah, an ideological lens in how they understood their religion, as a person of faith, were you able to incorporate that into your interrogations and say, well, you're a believer, guess what, I'm a believer, let's talk about this. Was, did religion come up in the interrogations? So, because I was working with Saudi detainees, certainly religion came up. It's just simply there in the room. Also, for these detainees, their understanding of what they were doing was tied to how they understood their own religion. However, at the same time, building trust is essential. Um, and the fact that I am a believing Christian is part of who I am. And there were, of course, many aspects of my own private life that never ever would have come into the interrogation room for security and safety reasons. But I did share with the detainees, for example, I had an interrogation on a Monday one time, and the detainee it was very polite. Again, these men were, um, some of them, were very sophisticated and respectful, especially respectful to a woman um, who's modestly dressed and who's respectful to him. Um, he asked, well, you know, I, I hope you had a nice weekend. And I mentioned, yeah, I, I had a nice weekend and I went to church yesterday. Uh, because their view of Americans was largely godless heathens. Mm. Um, they're unaware that there's these huge differences inside of American society. And yes, some of them could relate to um, another person who, who was a believer. How did your own Catholic faith develop during your time at Guantanamo Bay? I know there's a chaplain on site, mm. but did you go to the chaplain uh, for uh, spiritual guidance and for strength? Was your faith challenged when you saw men of another faith and what faith had driven them to do? Just, and you just said religion was so much in the air in those Saudi interrogations. So how was your own faith challenged and changed? When I was selected to become an interrogator and started training in 2003, and then my, my first um, tour at Guantanamo was in 2004, it happened to be a time in my faith life when I was struggling a lot in my own faith. Um, I had come into the Catholic Church as a convert in 1990 um, and, and loved the church and was Catholic, but um, I was just having a really hard time. The church that I discovered after I came in uh, is what I would now describe as a church that's very wounded. Um, but at the time I didn't understand that and so I was so discouraged and depressed by what I encountered that sometimes I would go to evangelical churches or not go to mass regularly. And so that's where I was at when this huge challenge came. And that is not an ideal place to be in. I, I read in The Lamp, uh, you wrote an article and you said, my faith was filled with holes and had no foundation. Yeah, 
and yet you had this huge challenge in front of you of surviving at Guantanamo Bay. Yeah, and, and also of decisions that I had to make that had moral consequence. Um, so in looking back on it, I, I realized, you know, we're not going to get to choose in life when the hard decisions are going to come. Um, they're going to be sprung on us. And I wish at that point that my faith had been deeper and had uh, more solid. But fortunately, a colleague there invited me to go to Mass one Sunday. And through that Catholic fellowship and the opportunity to go to Mass on Sundays in this incredibly stressful environment, um, my faith began to um, reopen and develop some solidity. You write a lot now about having a well-formed conscience. Do you think on Guantanamo Bay, in your experience with the people you dealt with, the people who maybe didn't have faith, who wanted to do interrogations a certain way, that that might have been what was missing, a well-formed conscience? Now, of course, they would argue what they're doing was ultimately to save more lives, foil more terrorist attacks. But in your opinion? I, I would agree. Um, and, and conscience formation is hardly a topic that we really talk much about today. You know, I didn't know anything about conscience formation when I went to Guantanamo. And I'd been a Catholic at that point for almost 13 years. I mean, I'd, I'd heard of it and I had some idea. But it sounds like a topic that's a course that priests take in seminary that's going to have lots of academic information about do this, don't do that. What I realized in Guantanamo is, first of all, that formation really needs to happen before the difficult challenges come. And because we can't predict when those come, the time for form conscience formation is right now. Because in, in a good conscience is able to listen to and respond to trying to do God's will. This is a question that probably most people watching couldn't even fathom. But as Christians, we are meant to believe in forgiveness ultimately, aren't we? And I know at the moment there's a military commission on in Guantanamo Bay. The US government is seeking the death penalty for many of the detainees. Do you think they should get the death penalty? What do you think should happen to them? The ones who are found guilty, for example, of helping to orchestrate something like the attacks on September the 11th? So I, I think I could really only comment specifically on the death penalty for an individual whose particular case I knew more about. But I am aware that um, I think that in cases the death penalty is um, one of the punishments that is sometimes used. And death penalty, for example, um, if, but back to your conscience, mm -hmm. you with having the well-formed conscience in alignment with God, what would God want, what would Jesus want? Is it the course of action that should be taken against some of the detainees there? I think those are very, very, very difficult decisions to be made. I'm definitely not in a situation where I would say they were involved in 9-11 death penalty. Um, but God also loves justice. Um, and that's where, um, as human beings and trying to figure out how to order society, um, we're trying to consider all of those at the same time. And God would want justice and mercy for the family members of the victims, for everybody. Do you think it is easier for you and someone of faith to have a more compassionate, I use that word in verticum, commas, and compassionate approach towards some of the people at Guantanamo because you believe ultimately they will face the ultimate trial and they will go before God one day and they will really be held accountable for their actions. But for someone watching this now who doesn't have faith and who believes that justice has to be served here and now and that is the only justice, that it's harder for them to see why they shouldn't face the death penalty or be given be tortured or enhanced interrogation techniques or whatever way you want to say it? I do think that understanding that there is a cosmic level of justice um, and that each of us as human beings will meet our maker um, does provide a broader perspective that's helpful. 
the experience in Guantanamo had a huge impact on me. It was the most radical experience I've had in my life with what it means to be a human being. When you've got to sit and talk with somebody who is an enemy, who tells you that they would be happy to kill you, and you're able to sit there and have a conversation, usually over tea, it um, is an astonishing human experience. And it helped me understand, for example, why we are called to pray for our enemies. Um, our, our enemies are part of being human along with us. Um, Jennifer Bryson, it's been a pleasure talking to you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.